Thank you. Well, actually, you know, the whole story is about one wet bread cross, and uh, that's all about sharing. That's the reason why I'm up here, because I really believe in what we do. You know, you heard a little bit about the background, I've, and I, by the way, a great selection of folks here. But there's all these different stages, and one of the things you got to really understand from the get-go, all that you heard about was I started when I was working, and I put my toe in, and then I put my foot in, then I put my leg in, then I totally get immersed, you know how that works. And now I'm retired, so I can put a lot more time into it. But the most important thing taking away from today is you can't get it all done at one time. You gotta take it like little pieces. But understanding the role. Because see, you were chosen. You know, when we lost, when many of you have not been part of the history of the Red Cross where we had to consolidate chapters and consolidate operations. And so for many years, the community always saw the physical building as the Red Cross. And it, they never understood it was the volunteers that really made up the Red Cross. It was the volunteers in that community that really were the face of the Red Cross. So in time, the organization of headquarters said, you know what, if having a community volunteer leader, I like to call it a community volunteer representative, is probably more pertinent because you're replacing that physical building. You're basically the touchstone to that community. And the reason why you were chosen is because you have to have the affinity and the understanding that you understand the community that you're being represented in. And, and the role that you play here is one of an intermediary, uh, of one of, uh, of frequently asked questions. You know, I didn't know about this about the Red Cross. If you want to look at it from another perspective, consider yourself a bird dog, for those of you who want. All right? Your job is to flush up the quarry. Let somebody else bring in the game. Because it's about what you know about the community allows you then to create the opportunities for the Red Cross to follow through its, its mission. And, but here's the thing. It's not knowing uh, how it is, it's how do we do it. How do we represent ourselves? How do we really go ahead and find out? And that's what this program is all about. It's the how. How do we do ourselves a better job in representing it? So when I first did this, because I had my own group, we were trying to figure out what are some of the basics? You know, we all come from different professional backgrounds, but we're applying our skill sets into this new world. And so you have to change your mindset to some degree as to how to play it. So the first one is the images for success. Now, I don't know how many of you are involved with Volunteer Connection. Volunteer Connection is a great tool for you to get resourced into the, into the sources of, of the Red Cross. And having a Red Cross email is an added value. Now you ask, well, why is that? Because honestly, if you're representing the Red Cross, you want communications around the Red Cross, you want the Red Cross email. You don't want your personal email, you don't want your, uh, your business email, it sends the wrong message. You want to have a Red Cross email so you have consistency. Business cards. You know, when I first started out, I had printed out my own business cards. We didn't have budgets for those things back then, right? But you ought to have your own business card for the Red Cross. Now that's not precluding you from mentioning that you're involved in your own business and in the course of what you have to do, but you are there representing the Red Cross. Ergo, you should have the Red Cross email, Red Cross contact information on your business cards, and I'm sure volunteer services will take care of that for you. Um, but it's also a professional way of approaching it. So, like just I gave you cards today, when you meet people, I met people this morning at, at my breakfast, I gave them my card, because I'm always networking. Um, logos. Now, for the longest time, we used to have to purchase them. Today, I think you, you know, Rick did volunteer services on a budget. They give you things. But again, you want to represent. It's a great brand. So when you're wearing a, 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 the brand of the Red Cross, there's two things that's happening. Number one, you're automatically recognized. So you're accepted. But number two, it creates an opportunity for you to have a conversation when you're outside that world. You're in, the, in a grocery line. And somebody says, hey, are you with the Red Cross? and you're off to the races, there's an opportunity for you to continue in sending the message. But it's also dressing for the part. You know, if you're going to be making presentations, you, you don't want to look like you just came off the golf course. But you can, if the opportunity is, 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 is in the golf club. But if you're making a presentation to a board or to a civic organization, you want to be dressed for the, for the part. Same thing with, uh, you're, you're getting your uh, stuff together. Um, I know a lot of people like their backpacks and all that kind of stuff, but when you, when you show up for a presentation, Having an organized presentation with a folder, with all the materials pre-printed so you can leave it behind, all gotten through the, uh, the site, you can get it going. And the last part is create a Red Cross file. 
Now, some of you are brand new, right? That doesn't preclude you from still putting in your Bible. Why did you join the Red Cross? What was your motivation? Because you see, when you're speaking to an audience and they're introducing you, the whole idea is to be able to connect to that audience. Now, if, you know, if you don't have a bio, you know how they introduce you? And here's the guy from the Red Cross. Or here's the guy from the Red Cross. You know, they're not going to give you anything because you haven't given them anything to say. But if you have a presentation that talks about your professional background and why you chose to be a volunteer, that gives more meat to your presentation because they identify to you. They relate to you because you're a peer that happens to be a volunteer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, so that, that's important. Also, get the audience engaged. Uh, those are important components, all right? And then getting a photo. Now, you can update those photos as you want, but that's, a, that's important too. All right? Ever since I joined the Red Cross, the question that always comes out is, or the, the response is, when you learn something new, I didn't know. How many of you said, have heard, I didn't know that about the Red Cross? Show hands. And you will continue doing that because it's such a big mission. And in your role, to try to understand that totally is really difficult. It really is. And you're not expected to know everything. But what you are expected is to where to go for the answers. And one of the most important places is the exchange. Because if you're ready into a volunteer connection, on that website, there's an easy link. And the word easy is really important in Red Cross. Uh, easy link to get any information you want. Presentations to different organizations, cued down to that particular group. Talking points about events that are taking place around the world, around the communities. Uh, just stats, information, so you can be better informed without going through a lot of effort. It's basically our Google. It's our customized Google, than anything you need to know. It's really, really, really an important resource for you to have. And I'm glad a lot of you are taking notes on this because it's something that, that you can be trained on, it's easy enough to do. The second part, if you really understand that your role is to be a, a provider of opportunity, it's really important that you understand who that opportunity needs to be directed to. You need to know not just your EDs, who are your counterparts, your partners, but who are the, the different resources that within your community they can refer the lead to? Because you're, you're a lead creator. You know, whether it's a volunteer connection because some volunteer person because they look to be a volunteer, or somebody wants to have a blood drive, or somebody wants to have an installation for a home fire campaign. Knowing who to go to is as important as you knowing what the need is. Because you've got connected two pieces to make it work. By the way, you can, this is a small enough group. You can raise your hands if you want embellishment. You know, it, it, it's fine. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it works if you want. The next part is the uh, training. One of the words. The time we talk about our hands. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the things that I am absolutely proud of and boast about is what distinguishes us from volunteers than others is that we're trained. We're trained. Those of us who have done disaster know our gaps. You just don't show up and do mass care. You're trained in the different skill sets that require that. That's something that when people are trying to connect to our community and understand what we do, giving them that idea that you just don't show up and we'll throw you to the wolves. Now say, no, no, no. We're going to train you for a skill set that you wish to exercise. That makes it more valuable, more tangible, and more importantly, more productive for that person to participate in our organization. Do not be afraid to and use the word train volunteer in your presentations. And Edge has come a long way from all our other <laughs> software packages that we've had. Really makes it that you can be trained two ways. You can be trained in class, or you can be trained on the computer. And it actually tells you which class or which. So there's a lot of opportunities for that. I like to use my, I have a little, uh, little iPad that I use for my presentations when I go into a talk to an LOL or, a, a, you know, a, 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 to elected officials or, uh, or to any presentation I make because I, I like the look. It's clean, it's, it's fresh, and I don't have to recreate the wheel. I'll just pull it off the exchange, put it on there, and, and, and present it. 
But you should have something that's easy enough for you to tell the story, and you, you use whatever tool that you want for that. The third part, the third part is you got to put in the time. You got to put in the time. You know, it's not about the, the function that you're going to be asked to do. It's not the face to face, but it's the homework before you go to that face to face. It's to understand how to navigate the system, to do all those components that, as I said, it's a big mission. I'm still learning to this day, and 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 and, and understanding that it's our job to be good at what we do, then you have to put the time in to do a good job of learning what it is that you have to do. And there's a responsibility. Look, you know, I'm really proud to be a volunteer, and I'm willing to put my time in. But you have to have that willingness to do so, because it does require time. And you can't say, I'm going to do something, then not do it. Now, it's different during a disaster, because you know, they're nipping at your heels, they're biting at your neck, you, you, you can't shirk that responsibility. But on, on blue skies, blue skies in turn when, you know, when it isn't hitting the fan, is you have to be responsible that if you have a task that's been given to you, or you've been asked to pursue a particular venue, to do so. Now, it's all self-managed. You, know, you report to your EDs, but at the end of the day, it's your responsibility <coughs> to accept that responsibility and execute on it because it helps build the organization. And without it, we, we won't be able to see. When you start using the tools of, of the Red Cross, both on the exchange and on the volunteer connection and all these things, the information then is much more transferable. You're not recreating the wheel every time. You're allowed to do it at that moment for whoever it is that you're doing it, and then they in turn can replicate it because you haven't recreated the wheel. You're using the same tools ongoing all the time. I said this at the beginning, <coughs> I'm going to say it again. You must understand that this is a growth position. You can't start at, at the aid level. It's just too hard. It's just so long. You, it, there's a requirement. So the first thing, the most important thing, is just real simple, understand the big picture. Understand the mission, which we're going to be covering in just a moment. That's your number one duty. So you know it so that if you're at a cocktail party, you know it if you're at, at, at a dinner, you're knowing it if you're on a golf course, if you're knowing it if you're at a baseball game, then somebody engages you in a conversation about the Red Cross, you could see it in your mind's eye, the storyline that you want to tell. It's not just the elevator speech. That's a second, another thought. You always have to have your eyes open for the opportunity. You know, you might be looking for blood, but now you're talking to somebody who just got elected into the position, and he said, and by the way, I'm the, I'm the uh, school board president. Oh, you are? Well, what should be coming into your mind right quick? Well, are you familiar with our preparedness program for children? Called the, home, uh, the pillowcase. Don't be afraid to deviate, to, to go into another lead, if there's an opportunity to do so. You always have to have almost like a Rolodex of opportunities as you're speaking to someone about all the aspects of need inside the mission. And as you're having that conversation, where can there be an interface that I can take advantage of and then capture enough information and direct it to the right person? You've got to stay sharp. You've got to stay current. You, you know, that's part of our responsibility as volunteers. That's why we continually go through training classes like this. We go training classes that you have disaster institutes, I'm sure, up here, things like that. You always have to stay sharp. And then at the end, when you've finally got it all the pieces together, then find the one that really suits you. Like, I like disaster services, and for me specifically, external relations. My gap, I, I, I could be managing any of those, those, those components underneath uh, disaster services and uh, external relations. But I took a lot of years to get there. That's my sweet spot. Okay, so I said, no mission. The presentation I'm about to go through here, I'm not going to give you the presentation. What I'm going to do is take each slide and tell you why that present piece of that presentation makes sense for the audience that you're about to speak to. <coughs> but this presentation I'm about to give you is the company, the company is me, the head, you know, headquarters uh, presentation. You know, old, old habits are hard to break, right? Um, it's the presentation that was created uh, by National, but it has been modified to accommodate uh, this region and some of the components that I thought made sense. Which is the first part, you understand. How many of you have used PowerPoint before? Show of hands. Okay. Now you all know that on all the PowerPoint presentations, you have the ability to create notes underneath your slide. 
And so for those of you who don't have confidence in speaking publicly right out of the gate, you can write your notes obscured from your public and read from your notes. And you can also put additional notes in that are not necessarily in you know, the words that you want to use from the headquarters. You can use your own words and, and, and present it, okay? And the last thing is to practice it. Like anything else, you just don't go up there. If you hit a golf ball, you need to have lessons. And you need to practice. And the same thing goes with making a presentation. You take enough time to make sure that you have the, the skill set and the timing of what it is that you want done, and you practice it, and you practice, and you practice. Okay? So let's go, into the, let's go into the presentation. Now, this is the actual presentation. Now, you use this presentation in front of civic groups, rotary groups, church groups, anybody who wants to hear about the mission. <laughs> now, the beauty of, of, of a PowerPoint is if you know how much timeline you have, you could, in, uh, you could remove or you could add slides that make the presentation work. So you have the empowerment to work within whatever time frame you have. The most important thing is understanding you want to get a point across and make sure that point is established within that presentation. Now, this is the big picture, so this is the whole picture. So the first part is about who started this whole crazy thing about international relief? Henry Dunant. Now, if you're talking to a rotary related to today, he's the Steve Case of today. He's the, he's the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Microsoft uh, owner. He was a businessman who was trying to do job. He was trying to make money. He was going to see Napoleon. But back then, they didn't have cell phones. You know what I'm saying? So they had to go out on a, war, a carriage, and he's going across the, uh, Italy, and there was a big battle between him and Austria, and it was a 30-mile range. By the way, this, this, this church is still there. For people who've ever traveled to Italy, the location is just below the Great Lakes and just above Verona. It's right, it's right there, right? So paint the picture that here's this guy trying to do business. He comes across this devastation of death, and he's horrified. He said, oh, my God. I got to do something about it. So he gathers in the local community and he said, I don't care what clothes that they wear, they are in need of help. And with that emotional connection, he went back home to Switzerland and wrote a book about his experience about warfare and how deadly it is and how we shouldn't be taking sides, we should just help out humanity. Well, that book got a lot of, got a lot of movement, which, which created the Red Cross movement. And people ask, well, why is it the cross? It's part of the Swiss flag. People don't know that. And why do you think Swiss is neutral today? Because of that. And people don't know that the very first Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to this fella. Now you tell that story to people today, they're connected. Because there's a lot of that that's required today to understand that. And because he had such compassion as a businessman. Yes? Do you know another organization he founded? The YMCA. Say right. Yeah. See? So when I didn't know that. When you're talking to your YMCA colleagues, you can, if you are, you can mention that fact. As that's well. a great point. Yeah. See, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So if you, the more information you know and you tailor it to your group, thank you for that. You can customize it to their storyline. So that's the story on that. So one of the biggest disconnects we have in America is we don't understand we're part of 189 societies. The American Red Cross is just one of 189 societies that exist for the same commonality that was originally started. And they're the ones who will support the Geneva Convention. And when you see on the news, especially in the Middle East and the other uh, areas of conflict, and you see the Red Crescent, that's us. They only use the Red Crescent because the cross had other significances, which we know doesn't count. But it looks like a cross, therefore it must be a cross, it has religious connotations, let's get rid of it, let's do the present. And then there's other symbols actually out there. Uh, Korea has their own one, and uh, not Korea, uh, uh, Japan has their own one, and, uh, and Israel has their own one. But at the end of the day, it, it's, it's that. And here's the foundation. Whenever we have issues here in the States about how we treat our shelter people or how we, we manage our affairs, we're using the same fundamental principles they were founded by the international organization. Universality, very important, right? Humanity, volunteer services, independent. We are not part of the government. We are part of that society underneath those principles. And we're neutral and we're impartial. And that's how we treat our shelters and how people get accepted inside there. Now, locally, you've got a great story to tell. You have
have a formidable woman that helped find the American Red Cross. And you don't understand the full story until you really understand her history. And you think about the time period. When she was a young girl, when her brother had, uh, got injured, now they were up at the uh, outskirts of Massachusetts in a farm community. Nobody was around. She had to take care of them. So she took care of them for five or six years while she was studying to become a teacher. And she started a school up in that neck of the woods. Right? And she got a really good reputation to the point that one of her friends said, hey, you know, Clara, I'm down here in Jersey in a place called Bordentown. And, I'm, and I, I really have a need of organizing these kids. Can you come down and help me? So she said, yeah, I'll, I'll come down and help you. If you ever drive down the New Jersey Turnpike, you see the Clara Barton Station. It's because she started the, this first school of education in, in Bordentown. Because back then, only people who had money could get educated. I'm talking about grammar school now. I'm not even talking about high school. All right? We're talking about the most rudimentary time of our lives in, in America. She organized it so well, now guys, get this, the man says, we got it from here. Because what was she then? A woman in a guy's world. And it didn't work then, that she had the, the audacity of being an organized leader. They said, we got it from here. So instead of her being angry, she just said, fine, you got it, it's all yours. She went down to Washington. And in Washington, while she was working, the Civil War broke out. And when the Civil War broke out, army and fate intersected. Because Lincoln had asked people to come down, troops from Massachusetts, to help protect the capital. And they were Massachusetts troops on their way down, and they got ambushed, and they got injured, and they lost lives, and they lost material. And these kids, these people that were troops, were people that she had taught when she was in Massachusetts in that little school that she was up there. When she realized that was the case, she came to the train station to try to say, what can I do? What can I help? She saw a need. She asked the community of Washington, can you give me supplies? Can you give me support? She received such great support, it overwhelmed her. To the point, that only was she able to accommodate those troops, but she had more than she could use, so she went to Lincoln. This was small government back then. She said, look, I got a lot of stuff here. Can I bring it out to the field? And Lincoln said, yeah, sure. You want to go? Knock yourself out. So she, now she brings all this material out to the field force, right? I don't know if you said quite those words. <laughs> but he said, you sure, what's the harm, right? So he goes out there, and now the other part of her humanity comes in. She's just like Henry Dorian. She sees the suffering and the hurt that was taking place on both sides. And she started now taking care of those people. And that's how she became the angel of the battlefield. And in today's meantime, that's a story that resonates. And you need to tell about that and talk about that because that's what we are as an organization. She was so tired from what she did after the war, she went to France, because that's what they did back then, to rehab. And that's how she met the storyline of Henry Durant and the Red Cross he was doing. She got it. She understood it because from her background that I just shared with you, she saw the storyline. She related to what he was saying. My God, two minds meet. She comes back, petitions for the Red Cross to join our society, and that's what she did. It's a great story. You agree? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. the, the one thing that's missing from that slide is that she began her work with the U.S. Sanitary Commission, um, which was tasked with actually serving initially Union soldiers, soldiers, but it was her experience on the battlefield that taught her about the need for the universality of this, plus the fact that she was a universalist. In fact, uh, eight out of the 10 women associated with the Sanitary Commission come from one particular religious background. That I didn't know. See, I tell you, I'm walking away with so much more information than that. <laughs> it's great. All right, so here's your elevator speech. I want you all to repeat it, because this, if you know this, you know this, you know this. Anybody says, what does the Red Cross do? Do it all together with me. The? American Cross Office prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. And when you're doing a public meeting, you do exactly the same thing. Because by hearing what they speak, it resonates better than just viewing it. Okay? So do that same thing. And you know, we continue the tradition of women leadership by having two great women. We have a businesswoman in, in Bonnie uh, Hunter. 
And we have Gail, who's also a businesswoman, came out of at and And let me tell you, this is no lie. Since she's been on board, she, she right sides the ship. She really did. They drove it in the right direction, cleaned it all up, and made it much more effective. We got better use of our donor dollars, and we've really come a long, long way in becoming an efficient organization. And we should really be proud that we have that kind of leadership going on. Now, this slide is, is a busy slide. So when you use this slide, don't, don't read all the numbers. If you look at the audience, if it's a young audience, talk about the measles initiatives. Because, you know, measles is in the news today, right? Talk about the fact that we're inoculating people around the world, not just over here. Or if you're dealing with somebody who's worried about the blood, talk about the blood services or the military. Pick a part of the slide, but don't go over the numbers. The next slide over here, the next slide over here is, uh, um, have any of you played this? Have any of you seen this? No. Mm -hmm. so right across a couple of years ago, I sent out a camera, uh, a video camera, to people that we helped out on the different services. Military, da, 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 da. And they said, please record your experience of how we did. So rather than us telling how well we are, having the client say how well we did is what this is all about. It's about a five minute slide. Now, a five minute uh, video. It's on YouTube. Now, the thing about this is that you need internet connection. So before you introduce this as a slide, make sure that you have the uh, internet connection in, in, to play. Otherwise, just skip it and just reference it, and there's a need to reference it at the end of the meeting. But they're really powerful emotional stories, and they really resonate. All right, so now, this whole presentation is about telling this story, right? You told the story about the big picture, you told the story about how we got started, you talked about our values, we, we kind of connected with our client, with our folks, and said, all right, so let me tell you about who we are locally. And so they understand that we're not just uh, a fragmented piece, but we're a very large organization with five local chapters, each chapter color coordinated, and each one is run by a particular leader. Now, this is the last slide, so I'm, I'm assuming it's all correct and accurate. Uh, this is what was given to me. You need to know who your EDs are in the other uh, chapters. <clears throat> Why? Because the lead that you might create in your backyard might be better managed by a corporate headquarters than might be in another chapter. So knowing that lead saying, hey, look, I just found this lead in, uh, in the, the Cape, but they're really, their headquarters is down here closer to uh, Connecticut. Let me, you know, let me give you a, the referral to that ED so they can take advantage of it and, and go for it. So knowing those contact numbers, they're all peers. They're all peers. This is what the beautiful thing about Rick Ross is. This is not you know, me or you. We're all on the same page, okay? So make sure that you understand that. And then the, the, then the, 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 the the foundation of your presentation is that we're trying to find volunteers, right? And the volunteers are the heart of our organization. And going back to my earlier point, that there's all kinds of volunteers. You don't have to be a disaster volunteer. You don't have to be a blood volunteer. You don't, have to, you don't even have to be in the field. There's so many roles, including being on the board, to being a, 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 a spokesperson for us, as you all are. Uh, there, there's so many things. So, so that, that's the big picture, okay? Tell them that we have 2,600. They're not by themselves. You have 2,600 volunteers. Your neighbor is probably a volunteer. Exaggeration. But the point being, speak about it because then they'll ask, did you ever think about volunteering for the Red Cross? Especially in my age group where everybody's trying to figure out what to do next, it's a good opportunity to have a conversation, okay? And especially today, there's so much case management that's virtual that you can actually have business owners that have some staff time that they want to donate for their team to just be virtual uh, case managers and dedicate that. It happens a lot during the disasters, okay? Lastly, let's go real quickly through the, uh, through the, through the services, okay? The services, you just, the, we have five different branches, right? Boom, 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 boom. Each slide has two purposes. The first slide talks about what we do. The second slide talks about the volunteer opportunity, all right? Now, you don't have to go through all these points, but the, the key point on services and armed forces is we're the only resource that gets them out of harm's way to take care of something at home. We're vetted, we're trusted, and the military comes to us, or we come to them, they know when we ask for help that somebody home needs help, they know we, we know what we're talking about. But more importantly, we also continue their training when they come back home, for the family as well as for the vet. Those are key points there. 
Now, here's the services opportunities. Now, I don't know your local homes or your local VA hospitals, whatever, but you may want to incorporate those names of those, those agencies and then know who to talk to if they are interested, <coughs> who your SAF leader is, and, and direct them in that, in that section. Blood services. Did you have your hand up? Oh. Um, blood services, look, let me be straight up. It drives the engine. It's a big economic opportunity for the Red Cross. It helps us, but we have to break even at the expenses. You know, I was at, I was at a meeting just recently. Not even a meeting. Where was I at? Golf! <laughs> and, 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 we're, and we're talking, and the guy said, you know, I was giving a lot of blood, but they changed things now because uh, they did something with the, with the, uh, with the buses, the blood mobiles. I said, well, do you know why? And I started telling them the cost of, of a blood mobile and their expense and how much, you know, you know. In other words, I was able to answer a question because I was informed enough about what it takes to get a pint of blood. So then that person understood who was a blood donor. Oh, I get that. That makes sense to me because I understand it. You know, so part of understanding blood services is understanding how we get the blood. But more importantly, tell the story that we founded plasma. We're the ones who created the concept of containing blood back then. How we've broken open more than the traditional uh, blood types because of all our research. If you're dealing with the uh, black community, speak to them about the sickle cell anemia, that we have a lot of definition about how to treat that because of our research. You can customize your, your conversation around blood to your audience. It's really, really powerful. And you should be really proud that the organization that you represent has such great, groundbreaking research. You need to correct or revert to every one that's. What was the question? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a typo. Yeah, yeah. 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 I saw it. I guess I, I just pulled it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally good. Okay. Uh, blood services. All right, again, talk about we represent 40% of the blood supply. Puerto Rico, a little quick fact. When Puerto Rico hit, everybody remembers about Puerto Rico, right? The number one thing we showed up with as our very first resources of, 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 of uh, humanitarian aid came over as our volunteers was we brought over blood. Because they lost all their blood. All the refrigeration units went to hell in a handcart. And all of a sudden they had nothing. Blood is more important than water. Without blood, you can't live. So we showed up there, and that's the first things we did. So there's opportunities for that. Disaster cycle services is also about to understanding the cycle. Everybody understands the response component, but not everybody understands that everything's interconnected. That preparedness, response, and recovery are all interconnected. Now, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, CPL, you'll spend a lot of time on preparedness. There's a lot of opportunities for us to talk about preparedness, and we'll talk about it in just a minute. But the response part and the training, not everybody understands the big picture, all right? So let's talk about preparedness. Preparedness is probably the easiest thing you could do as a CBL. All you need is an opportunity to pitch. Tell the story. We have great programs that are customized for whatever it is you want. We have the home fire campaign. We got the pillowcase. We got Red Cross ready. You can slice and dice it for whatever group or for whatever time frame you have to have, <coughs> but it works. That's something you want to spend a lot of time on. I do a lot of lunch at Lawrence. The, uh, the business owner brings in the pizza. I do the pitch in a half an hour, 40 minutes, and minutes, and it's all good. The response, there's two types of responses. And this is the one. What's the number one disaster that we have? Home fires. Home fires. Home fires. Home fires. 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 Happens every day, every, every eight minutes. All right? There's something happening. Now, for those of us who, who've done that, it's not the easiest thing in the world because the calls are always at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's just what it is. All right? But for retired firemen, I said, look, you're used to getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Why don't you consider becoming a DAC volunteer? Right? You're used to doing it. Now they're exempt. I said, you can still stay in the game, but you're looking at it from another perspective as a lead source. Yeah, so those are, those are the most important ones, and those are trained, but we can could, we could support that. The declared disaster, these are the headings. Mass care, services, external relations. But people don't understand all the subsets of these. This typical disaster has hundreds of volunteers, hundreds, that are our opportunity. All they got to figure out is which one they want and we will recover it. This is a point I, I spent a lot of time on because people don't fully grasp. 
When we raise the money that we raise, fundraising, right? When we raise the money we raise, we meet our initial obligation. We meet that, that first thrust of, of need. But when we finish meeting our initial need and there's still money left over, we create great opportunities for recovery through vetted agencies, uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, uh, Catholic Charities, uh, you name it. We, if we have money left over, we create great opportunities for these folks to help them continue in the mission of our common client. And we also have online and, and in-person licensed people, both in spiritual and mental health care. Training services. They just changed it. It used to call it uh, another label, but now it's training services. How many of you, and this is a question I ask the audience, how many of you have ever had Red Cross training of some nature? This is it. This is the group. Okay? Connect. This is the group. Whether it's life saving, CPR, whatever. But now the new thing, and now you make the audience take out their cell phone and put in the app. Because we have apps. You know, you know, walk them through the idea of how to get the app, put in the first aid app, the pet app. Uh, where's the fellow with the, with, the, uh, with the pets? John, right. Pet app. First aid for the pets. Boom. That should be part of your presentation when, you, when you're doing it. All right. Bring, bring it to, so they can relate to it. All right. And we, we have the training. By the way, this is a fundraiser money maker too. So when you're talking to a group and they want CPR training or they want a defibrillator, that's another fundraiser that we can we could make money on if we can bring. International, we're coming into the home stretch here. Uh, not people, again, don't always think about it, but we, we're the biggest fundraiser of international relief. But we also spend a lot of time in helping people get the, uh, reconnected who are displaced. With all the immigration societies that are going on today, uh, connection is really, really important. So we have teams here in the States that reconnects people through family links. We're also trying to push a lot more understanding of humanitarian law. And, and, and in classes, they have this thing called RAID. And during the summer, uh, these uh, Red Cross clubs have uh, uh, basically a scenario that if you, you were this, the student, you now become a prisoner of war. How are you treated? How are the resources of the Red Cross being come, come to play? It's really kind of a cool thing, and we need people to do that. The underlying foundation of everybody we recruit to and how we deal with goes right back to the very first slide I started, and that is universality and diversity. We're diverse in who we deal with supplies, we deal with our partnerships, and our workforce. It's who we are and how we want to be as diverse as we possibly can. Okay. This last slide is a summation. It's your wrap up, it's your close. It's kind of capturing all the different points that you just made in the last few slides. You're summarizing it, and it's basically, it, it, you know, we aspire to turn compassion into action. We aspire to turn action into compa uh, compassion into action. And then each line covers each one of those missions. Now you can repeat it, or you can just have them read it at your call, whatever your time frame is. <coughs> but always end that any volunteer we come and ask to join us, we will train in whatever tasks they're asking to do. So they will not be embarrassed, they'll be supportive, and they'll be useful. All right. Now, this is the closing. Yeah, then there, there's an, uh, uh, you know, the next, there's like five more slides that basically say, how do you sign up? Okay? For the sake of time, uh, we cut them out. And now we're going to talk about your mission. Now, this, is, this is not part of the program. This is you. You have a big job. And I think, in looking at the picture, as I just pointed out to it, your job is really to find the opportunity to make us a better organization. It's not easy. And part of it is understanding all those different components. But the first thing you have to understand is how you work with your executive, the executive director. Now, there's a lot of dotted lines there. But they, if you don't know, they know. If you don't know, they know. They know who to call. But you should know all those different positions. You should know who the SAF, we have acronyms. By the way, the new folks, the acronyms just go on, all right? But just un un understand that, that, that because it's, you can't fit it all in the box that they use the acronyms. Uh, SAF is uh, Service to the Armed Forces. Uh, the, the PHSS is no longer that's training services, biomed is blood, you know, so forth and so on. But understanding how to get information uh, and getting back to the person who's asking for it, that's your job, and using the ED is going to be your resource to do it. That's who you report to. So for you, looking forward, going forward, right? You might already have some relationships going 
Maybe your ED already has some connectivity into the community. Your job is to make it better, to enhance it, to make it more fulfilled. Uh, blood drives are one of those things that you, if people don't know what it takes to run a blood drive, they'll never run it. But if you know the components of a blood drive, what it takes statistically, you know, what, what are the right numbers to make it work, then you can, you can have the right conversation with the right audience. You know, sometimes I, I literally drive through uh, parking lots and I, and as I'm driving uh, to golf, and, uh, and, and I see a, a, a business got parking cars all over the place, and, and it's a little building. I said, I want to talk to these folks. I want to walk in and say, what kind of business are you at? I said, let me introduce myself. I'm the local guy with the Red Cross, and uh, have you guys ever considered doing a blood drive? No. Would you like more information on that? Yeah, I'll get back to you. That's what you do. You know, it's, it's, it's just that easy, right? Because then you put them in touch with the right people, you put the information out, and so forth. Home fire campaigns. I've, I've introduced a lot of home fire campaigns through my church groups. You know, people, you know, our target audience with the, uh, with the home fire campaign has always been the underserved. I'm going to tell you a real quick, a quick story about a home fire campaign that affects me. I, my mother's going to be 97 next month. God bless, right? But that died a long time ago, and she had her own little house, Italian, Italian ranch. You know what I'm talking about, Italian ranch? Downstairs finished, upstairs finished, you got to do it. <laughs> when I had to sell the house, what do you have to sell the house you have to have in the house? Small one. I went in there, the damn thing, cobweb. Now, she was a little tiny thing. She could never got up. And I never thought of changing it. My own backyard. And it was dawning in my mind that, that the, the seniors are also an underserved community. So I went into the local church groups and I said, you know, do you have senior clubs? Oh, yeah, I have senior clubs. How would you like to have a campaign that you would like to take ownership of to drive the concept of what I just talked about? And one of them became my board member. I got a board member out of that. And we put him on the board, but it was because my involvement in the church. So there's there's so much linkage between what we can do in the mission and enhancing the mission in other ways. So it's not always linear. Think of it very global, very spatially, that you have a lot of opportunities. Same thing with pill case. Now, pill case is a little more difficult because you can create the opportunities, but we don't always can support it because it's a budgetary control. They already do the planning ahead of time. But you can prospect for the interest, put it into the queue so they know that there will be an interest for that. And obviously, you know, the building the volunteer supports is really, really key. So that's my presentation. When, you know, this is the this is the close on, on the uh, on the regular presentation. Roll up your sleeves. This is where that, remember I told you that the video is the redcross.org stories. So if somebody wants to hear more about it, that's where it's at. But roll up your sleeves, get into it. It's really a lot of fun. You feel really great by representing our organization, and more importantly, you feel like you made a difference. Thank you. Bravo.